it's still not four, so it's absolutely all it's right. Uh, just wanted to know one thing, uh, Nena. How have you? How how do you usually time these uh, discussions? So, for how long do you want me to go on in a lecture kind of a mode? And uh, when is it that you uh, initiate interaction, or is it from the beginning interactive? So. I'm open to both, so just let me know. What is your, how, how is it that you've done this before? Ma'am, so usually we used to have a lecture uh, for 45 minutes, and then we begin with a question answer round. Like we take questions from Zoom and YouTube also because we have a bandwidth okay. of 100 you students on Zoom. We also have a YouTube live going on. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Fine. Then we'll, uh, then I'll take the questions. I'll pass on the question to both from YouTube and uh, Zoom to you. Right. And then right. We'll and we are looking. If that for, works for you. That's that, that. That's absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine. And okay. What is uh? And the other thing is, uh, I'm sure it is important. It's still not so possible to tell, but what is the nature of people who participate? Are they students mostly? If students, um, is there a certain kind of disciplinary background? Uh, so yeah, again, from past experience, what is it that you've seen? Ma'am, though we have a actually very diverse and multidisciplinary crowd, like we have a like we have students from different disciplines. We have students from engineering background also. We have professors also. So we have like a we have school students also. So it's like a very diverse crowd. Oh. That's a that's a lovely big outreach that you are doing, I should say. Yeah. And that's okay. what our basic aim is to make this very idea of feminist philosophy to very accessible to everyone from all disciplines. Great. You will say something about the about the philosophy project when you begin. I'm a little interested to hear also about your collective and how is it that you come together. What was the thought behind all of it? I'm more sure, interested than uh, maybe the listeners know it already, but I want to know very briefly. So I'll be grateful if you say a few words about it. Sure, ma'am. Sure. Okay, fine. I'll I'll put myself on um you know on mute and also uh, uh go off my video. But when we begin, we'll uh yeah. Fine. Yes. Uh, hello. Hello, Professor Rukmani. Uh, I'm Dr. Ritu Jaswal. Yes, and uh, Jaswal. yeah, uh, I'm not feeling well today. And that is why, even though I'll be there for the entire session, but not be very uh, interactive. And uh, uh, probably Nena will take care of the session. But yes, welcome to this program. And uh, sorry for that, I, I won't be actively able to uh, participate today. Okay, and thank you so much. I'm so grateful that you are still tuned in despite you not feeling well. Please don't feel pressurized to be around for the entire time. No, I couldn't have missed your lecture. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And Nana, thank you for taking care of the session. Okay, ma'am. Uh, okay, so I think it's like a good time to start. So hi everyone, I'm Nena Bhargav and I welcome you all at 7th lecture of Feminist Philosophy lecture series by the Philosophy Project in collaboration with ICPR, MAP, uh, Delhi University chapter and for today's lecture we are having Professor Rukmani Sain and our course instructor Ritu Jaiswal ma'am with us. So as ma'am as like a brief introduction about the Philosophy Project. So the Philosophy Project is started uh, a year before, it's this small WhatsApp group that we started with to make a peer study circle, to make academies uh, accessible, considering philosophy is a very elite subject. A lot of texts and writings are not that very accessible, like the language is not very accessible. So this is the idea we began with to create a peer group. Uh, and we started with our book discussions. We have a book discussion club where we meet regularly, discuss book articles, chapters. And uh, then like uh, we continuously engage through academic journal, blogs, uh, and stuff on philosophy lecture series. 
and by the like from with the help of Dr. Titu Jaiswal Ma'am, we started this project called the, uh, this whole feminist philosophy series, where we started the discussion around different aspect of feminist philosophy from epistemology to metaphysics to uh, Dalit feminist theory, then uh, f feminist ethics, and now we are here with feminist bioethics. Then we are here with feminist jurisprudence. So uh, this is like a small journey of the philosophy project. And on 17th July, we like completed our one year of running this organization. It's a complete student run organization. So, uh, so sh uh, shall I begin with today's lecture? Okay. So in today's lecture, add to feminist jurisprudence, Professor Sain will engage with the concepts of equality difference, consent, and care through different legal movements in India. While there has been a continuous debate around inevitability and impossibility of feminist arguments with the legal system, law remains a contested site of transformation through trajectories around feminist jurisprudence. This lecture would try to understand these contestations by focusing on a few movements of law and feminist uh, encounters in independent India. So before uh, we begin, I would like to introduce ma'am. So ma'am is a professor, School of Liberal Studies at Dr. Uh, Ambedkar University, Delhi, and currently director, Center for Publishing, with a teaching experience of 18 years. She offers a course on law and society, relationships and affinities, gender and society, culture, hierarchy, and differences. She is the recipient of Viscom, uh, Women in Security, Conflict Management and Peace, Sahas Award 2020, recognizing continuous engagement with curricula using intersectional lens. She was co-investigator, feminist talim, teaching feminism, transforming lives, question of identity, pedagogy, violence in India and the UK. The project was funded by UGC UK, Ambedkar University, Delhi in collaboration with University of Edinburgh, Scotland, UK. She has several publications at EPW, Zuban, Sage Publication, Routledge. She has been closely engaged with the COVID-19 pandemic from a feminist sociological approach through many lectures and she has published Stay, Stay Home, Stay Safe, Interrogating Violence in the Domestic Sphere at EPW Engage. Her forthcoming book chapter is titled Home, Violence and the Pandemic Sociological Discourse and Reimagination of India. Thank you, ma'am, for accepting our invitation. It is a complete pleasure for us to have you. Looking forward for the session. Thank you very much, Nena, for uh, inviting me here. Uh, it, is, uh, it is always wonderful uh, when students get together, form collectives, and, and the fact that you've already crossed one year, congratulations on that. And this one year has been the pandemic year. And you have been able to meet and keep yourselves going online. So that is a huge, huge, uh, you know, effort and initiative on your part. I can only imagine how much effort goes into organizing these, you know, uh, getting people come together. You said that you do big book discussions. You have, uh, you know, you engage with blogs and academic writings uh, and all of it with a, with a really, really important purpose of making knowledge more accessible. And, uh, and I think that that is something which, uh, which each of us, uh, you know, in some way or the other needs um, need to um, uh, need to endeavor. So huge congratulations on completing one year. I hope that the philosophy project uh, run by students uh, actually goes on for many more years to democratize knowledge. And and I'm extremely delighted to be here today as as you said, uh, this, um, you know, I was, it's, it's a vast area, feminist jurisprudence, and, uh, you know, how is it that one, one would uh, structure that, uh, that vast area, it's, that's, that's always a very difficult task. Uh, but 
as I wrote to you in, uh, you know, in, in, in some kind of uh, abstractish form, that I will try to use four concepts and try and engage, you know, conceptually with these concepts, but also look at what has happened in the legal framework around these concepts. So that's, that's basically the idea. The four concepts that I'm choosing for today, and, uh, you know, people might ask, why is it that I chose these four and not four others? I could have probably done with four other kinds of concepts, but I think there is some rationale and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that as I go along. The four concepts that I have chosen, which Nana has already said, the first is equality. The second is difference. The third is consent. And the fourth is care. The reason for choosing equality and difference is very simple. Uh, primarily because if we look at the entire project of feminist jurisprudence, I think feminist jurisprudence historically, both globally as well as in India, has, uh, has been based on this twin principle of equality and difference. If we look at the global you know, feminist movement, etc., the principle of equality was something which came through what was known as the suffragette movement. Uh, so women asking for voting rights, basically. But the reason for women asking for voting rights is important for us to remember. Why were women denied voting rights? They were denied voting rights because they were thought to be irrational and they did not own property. So clearly the connection between rationality and holding of private property was considered to be the benchmark of who can vote. So you can very clearly imagine that there was only a very small section who could vote, right? It was the white man who would actually vote, white propertied man who would vote. In, and, and this I'm talking about, you know, most of Europe as well as America. So the entire 1920s in, in Europe is actually the period of suffragette movement where there is a demand for equality equal rights for voting, equality with respect to work, uh, equal pay for equal work. These were the kind of demands that you see in, um, you know, in all over Europe. In America, it happens later after the civil rights movement. So the 1960s are, is actually an important time of civil liberties in the US. In the Indian context, what is important for us to remember is that very interestingly, from the time we became an independent nation, which was 1947, in 1950, when we get the constitution or when the constitution is adopted, we see that all adults have been given a voting right. So one man, one vote, yeah, a very famous uh, phrase, that Dr. B. R. Ambedkar used in many of his, uh, you know, constituent assembly debates, that is something that we see enshrined in the constitution itself. So universal adult suffrage is something that we begin with in India. But it's also important to remember that the fact that we have this, we had this, it didn't happen, you know, on one fine day. It was at the Karachi Congress resolution, which happened in the 1930s, that for the first time, the right to vote for all adults was for the first time raised in the Karachi Congress resolution. So it is from there that we can go back and look at, you know, this, this equality principle of voting rights for men, women, and all adults uh, to the Karachi Congress resolution. Together with it, it is important also to remember about the constituent assembly debates and the fact that there were 15 women members in the Indian constituent assembly. 
yeah these women these women are spoken about very less when we think about and talk about the constitution and the constituent assembly there are a few men that we talk about right uh, nehru uh, azad patel rao and definitely ambedkar as the chairperson of the drafting committee of the constituent assembly but there were 15 women who were part of the constituent assembly and very interestingly if we look at an i Uh, you know at this moment i'll not get into the backgrounds of them but if you look at their backgrounds then these 15 women actually represent a plurality in terms of class caste religion and region in india and to be a part of the constituent assembly you had to be an elected member it was no nomination so these were all of these women had very thriving political lives and they became part of the const they were they were elected to become part of the constituent assembly and uh you you actually had as i said a cross section of people a cross section of women within this constituent assembly who very interestingly talked about two things with respect to equality so i'll i'll, I'll speak about this two uh you know from from various uh, speeches that they have given i'll speak about two of them one is that most of these women in the constituent assembly they talked about the importance of economic and social rights for women and all marginalized together with civil and political rights so what was important for us to understand is that from the very beginning that the importance of social economic and social rights was emphasized together with civil and political rights the reason being that you might have something written in the text of law but unless the social condition is relevant unless the social condition is right then the law will remain only in text will remain only in paper and that is what is known as formal equality so most of these women members of the constituent assembly they actually said that while formal equality is important what we also need is substantive equality we cannot do without substantive equality i'll come to what substantive equality is in a bit so this was first this was one thing that you know most of these women members said the second thing that these women members said was that they were against any special treatment to be meted out to them as women now i'm sure you understand that in the current context or in fact in the way in which the uh, you know discourse around women in politics has emerged in india the special treatment argument has actually taken a huge uh, you know leap i'm sure more, many of you know about the debates around the women's reservation bill in the parliament uh, or many of you would be knowing that in 1991 through the 73rd amendment of the indian constitution there was reservation of seats for women at the grassroots level and that is the reason why at the level of panchayat there is a reservation of seats for women but we have not done reservation of seats for women at the level of the parliament the 33 person reservation bill is something which is pending for the last two decades however what is interesting is to remember that during the constitution framing women who were part of the constituent assembly they felt that they do not need any special treatment so they were arguing philosophically i would think through the lens of equality and equality was the basic principle through which debates around the constitution was actually discussed so based on the principle of equality what you have in the indian constitution is article 14 and article 15 so article 14 talks about right to equality and article 15 talks about non discrimination on the basis of sex caste race religion language creed place of birth 
So Article 15 is, so you know, you what I'm trying to say is that you have to read Article 14 and Article 15 of the Indian Constitution together. Whereas Article 14 says that everybody will be treated equally in the eyes of law. Article 15 says that there will be no discrimination on the basis of social locations. Yeah, and these social locations, as I said, rests on caste, sex, race, gen, caste, sex, race, religion, place of birth, creed, language. So you have to read equality and non-discrimination together. So in the Indian context, the philosophical project of equality is intrinsically a project of non-discrimination as well. Yeah, I think this is important for us to remember and mark a distinction from the way in which, you know, equality rights movements have happened in other parts of the world. In India, it is equality together with non-discrimination. But what is important for us to remember is that although the law may give us equality, we necessarily do not live our everyday lives in equality. We actually live our everyday lives in hierarchy and indifference, right? So what therefore, again, is very interesting to see in the Indian con constitution is that there actually are special provisions that are made in the Indian constitution to address the principle of difference. So what I'm trying to say before I move forward is that equality as a principle is correlated with non-discrimination in the Indian constitution and equality and non-discrimination in the Indian constitution coexists with the principle of difference. So there isn't any conflict between equality and difference in the Indian constitution, equality and difference in the Indian constitution complement each other. How? So the example that I would like to give is that if Article 15 said non-discrimination on the basis of sex, race, caste, religion, language, place of birth, Article 15.3 of the Indian Constitution says that special provisions can be made for women and children. And Article 16 of the Indian Constitution is the basis on which the principle of affirmative action is resting. The principle of affirmative action in India, as you most of you would be knowing, happens through the policy of reservation. Affirmative action is not equal to reservation. Affirmative action is reservation plus many things. And that has a philosophical basis in the Indian constitution. The basis is historical injustice. So the way in which the Indian constitution responds to the principle of difference is that the Indian constitution says, literally says it, you know, in, in, in so many words, it says that it is important for us to remember that certain communities have faced historical injustice. And in order to right the wrong, the right here is R-I-G-H-T, not W-R-I-T-E. So in order to right the wrong, you need to treat certain people and communities differently. So the principle of equality will not be able to ensure equality if you treat unlikes alike. Yeah, You have to treat people differently because social contexts are different. Yeah. That is the basis of special treatment for women and children. Since I'm not doing a discussion around, you know, caste-based jurisprudence, so I'm not getting into in detail principles of affirmative action, etc. But if there are questions, that I'm, then I can take it later. But I would restrict myself to the principle of difference through special treatment for women and children. 
So that is part of the fundamental rights chapter of the Indian Constitution. Article 15.3 of the Indian Constitution is special treatment for women and children. But we also have in the Indian Constitution what is known as the directive principles of state policy. Through the directive principles of state policy, there are special provisions that are made for the health and safety of women when they go to factories to work. The, the specific legislation of the Maternity Benefits Act emerges from the fundamental right of special treatment for women and children and the directive principle which says that it is the responsibility of the state to ensure health and safety of women when they go to work in factories. That becomes the basis of what is known as the Maternity Benefits Act. It was a legislation which got passed in 1961 in India. And the reason why we have the Maternity Benefits Act in 90, as early as 1961 is because the International Labour Organization, also known as the ILO, they passed a convention which said that, uh, that there has to be certain benefits that are given to women when they go to work. And, you know, work in that context was always factory. It is not so anymore. And there has been a change to the Maternity Benefits Act in 2017. The understanding of the workplace has undergone a change. But in 1961, you had the Maternity Benefits Act. Now, what is important to remember is that if we only moved with the principle of equality, then we wouldn't have had a Maternity Benefits Act. Right? Why? Because it is only because you understand that there you need to you need to acknowledge that women you need to acknowledge that women are workers and women also can give birth reproductively to babies. Yeah. That is the reason why you needed the Maternity Benefits Act. Yeah, the Maternity Benefit Act is not needed by men, it is needed by women. Yeah, what we saw over a period of time is something called paternity leave, but that is very different. Yeah, and again, you know, if you have questions, I'll take those in the question answer session. But paternity leave is very different from a Maternity Benefits Act. Maternity Benefits Act is a right that women have as workers in India, yeah? And it's very interesting that one of the early uh, documents uh, of, um, you know, one of the early documents which kind of laid down the vision of um, uh, vision and policy of how is it that we would treat women in India. This was a 1948 document which was called Women's Role in Planned Economy. In that document itself, this provision of maternity benefits was something which was actually suggested that, you know, if women, so one is that it is important to ensure that women go out and work. Yeah. But then it is also important to ensure that the workplace will give women some, some, some benefits. Yeah. And one of those benefits was thought to be maternity benefit, which is basically a paid leave. If you know what maternity benefit is, it is basically a paid leave for at this moment. For It started with 60 days, then it moved to 120 days. Now it has become 180 days. But then what is still what is critical or even ironical is which women can access or have the benefit of maternity benefit. It is only women who work in the formal sector. And we all know that in India, most women, more than 90% of women's labor happens in the informal sector where you do not have the Maternity Benefits Act. Yeah. So, so that's, that's, that's the irony of the situation. Uh, and, you know, I want to flag it and ask all of us to reflect on it and think about it. But in terms of principle, what I'm trying to 
uh, you know, what I'm trying to talk about is that it is important for us to keep in mind that while there is an equality principle, there is side by side a principle of difference, a principle of difference which treats women differently because of both the social and the economic and other kinds of conditions that women uh, you know, women are, are, are living in their everyday life. Another example, a second example that I would want to give about the, about, you know, the special law made for women, keeping her social context in mind, is the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act. So this is a legislation that we have from 2005. And in this legislation, the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act, this particular legislation, we see that for the first time, there is a way in which the law recognized that domestic violence happens to all women, not just married women. Because still before 2005, there was some kind of an understanding that, you know, Cruelty is something which is faced only when women get married. So it's like before marriage, there is no cruelty or outside of marriage, there is no cruelty. But all of cruelty happens or all of violence happens only when women are married. 2005, this particular legislation brings, you know, violence at the center. It brings violence at the center of everyday life and living and actually by calling it domestic violence, it actually suggests that violence is a constant feature in any household. Basically, that is what it suggests, that violence is something that women encounter in any domestic sphere. And it is not only husbands who can be violent on women, it could be brothers, it could be father, it could be the uncle, it could also be someone with whom the woman is living in is in a is in a relationship which is not marriage but ha, is spending a considerable amount of time in a domestic space so violence is something which is uh, you know which is intrinsic and which is something which is quite foundational to to the everyday lives of women and it's in 2005 that for the first time you you have uh, you know the parliament passing the protection of women from domestic violence act and suggesting that uh, you know it is not just marriage it is a reality in any kind of domestic household so that is again you know a principle of difference that the law enshrines a third example of difference is that I would want to talk about is through a judgment, which very interestingly, while it had all the all the uh, social realities to to foreground difference, it decided not to do so. Yeah, and it became controversial, and that's the reason why I think it's important for us to know about it. This judgment is popularly known as the Kerlanji judgment. And for those of you who know, Kerlanji is associated with a certain kind of massacre. Yeah, it's called the Kerlanji massacre, uh, which happened in, uh, you know, somewhere near Bombay, not in Bombay, but somewhere near Bombay. So it's under the, so this, this, kind, this judgment actually was delivered by the Bombay High Court where a family, where a Dalit family of the caste belonging to, and this, this was known, they were known as the Bhut Manges, that was the caste that they belonged to, where this Dalit family was brutally, so they were burnt, they were raped, and they were murdered. Yeah, There were to a total of seven people, only one of them survived, and that is the person who, you know, kind of carried on with, the, with this case and took it took it to court and uh, you know this this was this was committed by upper caste people who were living in close proximity to this dalit family this dalit household very interestingly the one uh, you know the one reason the main reason for this violent attack 
on the Dalit household was that uh, their, their household lied in, or, or it fell in the track of the property which belonged to the upper castes. And the Dalit family could actually take a possession of that land. Yeah. And this act of violence was literally like an act of, you know, teaching them their position. Yeah. That, you know, somebody or a family who is socially marginalized, how does that family even dare to own or possess land? Yeah. And that, and this was, this actually happened. Eventually, the murder happens one day, but the process of exploitation and humiliation happened over a period of time. Now, what happened is that, in, again, in India, we have a legislation which is called Scheduled Caste, Scheduled Tribes, Prohibition of Atrocities Act. Yeah, this is the only legislation in India which gives a definition or yeah, which gives a definition of what is an atrocity. An atrocity committed on a Dalit person in India, an atrocity committed on a tribal person in India. This is the only legislation which defines what is atrocity and actually says that this is an act of humiliation. And if an act of humiliation happens publicly with an intention that this atrocity is being connected is being committed knowingly that these people are Dalits and tribals, then you can make a complaint. And then the case would be registered under the SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act. So that is what the surviving member of the Bhutvange family had done. It from the district court, it went to the Bombay High Court. Very interestingly, the Bombay High Court actually gave a judgment of uh, of death penalty to, to these, uh, you know, upper caste people who had committed the murder. However, although it gave the judgment of death penalty by which, you know, they, they recognized that there was rape, they recognized that there was murder, they recognized that you know, this was something which is uh, which is rarest of rare. That is the only situation in which you can give death penalty. The judgment said that we can't, however, prove that this act of rape and murder happened because they belonged to the scheduled caste. So they took away the caste dimension from the punishment yeah and said that this is an act of rape and murder but this is not an act of rape and murder because these people belong to the lower caste so what happened is that they actually took away the scheduled caste scheduled tribes prevention of atrocities act that provision was completely taken away from the judgment yeah you, 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 of course, you know, section 375, which is the provision of rape, that is uh, used. Section 304, which is the provision of murder, that is used to give death penalty. However, the specificity of a caste based violence was taken away from the Bombay, from this particular case. So the Bombay High Court said that you cannot, there is no evidence to prove that this rape and this murder was happened with an intention to rape and murder a Dalit woman or a Dalit man. Yeah. So that's the, that's the Kerlanji, uh, you know, judgment where I felt that, you know, and, and, and people like Anand Teltum, they, they have written about it in great detail. And what is, what is important for us is uh, that, uh, that, uh, you know, it, it, it takes away from, from, from this act, the specificity of power and domination, which led to the committing of the act in the first place. Uh, somebody has written uh, that the Hathras case, absolutely, uh, you know, uh, the Hathras is, uh, you know, to me, as I was reading through the Hathras, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, report, etc., I actually felt that 
It's literally a repeat of the Kerlanji thing. The only thing is that Kerlanji goes to court and it's the court which says it. In Hathras, it has still not gone to court. It's, uh, you know, it's this, um, uh, it's still within media. It's still what the police is doing. So the police is not wanting to register the complaint under the SCST's Prevention of Atrocities Act. But, you know, it's, it's very important for us to remember that the SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act is, is one of the most powerful legislations that we have, and yet it remains very toothless. So, you know, so what I said, you know, with respect to the principle of difference, if you realize, I, I did, I, I'm talking about the principle of difference with respect to that the law is guaranteeing us equality, but then the substantive condition is such that you need to treat certain people and communities differently. So therefore, in order to ensure substantive equality, you need to hold on to the principle of difference. And that is the basis of 15.3 of the Constitution. That is the basis of the Maternity Benefits Act. That is the basis of the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act. That is also the basis of SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act. And yet the Kerlanji judgment takes away from it the principle or, you know, the specificity of the difference. So it's these with these four examples that I'm trying to tell you what is, you know, conceptually, how is it that we've seen the principle of difference in these legal, you know, moments in India. I move to the next concept, which is consent. And the next two that I will do, which is consent and care, I would think, uh, is something that is that is kind of coming from um, you know the re recent work and research that I have been doing over a period of time. I would think for the last uh, you know six seven years around consent and you know more closely uh, more recently around care. Now I'm sure all of you know that the question of consent comes into existence especially when we deal with rape laws yeah so when you when you think about rape then the you know then then proving non consent is valuable yeah so the woman who complains that she has been raped she has to prove in court that she did not consent to the sexual intercourse, yeah. Because only if she can prove that she did not consent to the sexual intercourse, can you prove that it is rape? Because if it is consensual, then it is an act of consensual sex, it is not rape, right? And this has to be proved in the eyes of law and that's, that's an uphill task, yeah. It is not easy to prove in the court that you did not consent to it, primarily because most rape cases do not have any witness. Yeah, and in criminal law, witness is some, something that is very important. The witness in a rape case is the one who is the complainant, which is the woman who has been raped. Yeah, I am the own witness of my, you know, incident of rape because I don't have 40 people around you know, looking at rape, of course, gang rapes happen, of course, rapes happen in wars, in situations of conflict, those are different, and I'm not getting into those. But again, you know, if uh, in discussions, we can talk about it, I'm just I'm at the moment talking about, you know, rape that happens on a 101 basis, right? There, you usually do not have witness. But then the woman who complains in the police station, that woman has to prove that this was a non -cons. This was forced. This sexual act was forced on her. It was not consensual, right? Now, the, the first most important in independent India, the first most important case around rape that actually came, uh, made headlines is popularly known as the Mathura rape case. And again, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's something to be said that when we remember the Mathura rape case, we have to remember that she was a tribal girl again in Bombay. Yeah. And I'm just thinking that Kerlanji was something which is dealt by the Bombay High Court. Mathura was also something which actually was dealt by, uh, you know, the lower courts and then the Bombay High Court. Then it came to the Supreme Court, of course. 
So Mathura, a tribal young girl, was raped in a police station. Yeah. So it was not just an act of rape. It was also an act of custodial rape. Why? Because it was happening in police custody. Mathura had gone to the police station to make a complaint against two men who were harassing her. Yeah. And when she had gone to make that complaint inside the police station, she was forcibly raped. She had, you know, taken, taken along with her uh, 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 somebody she knew. And if you read the judgment, then you will see that this man who she took along with her has been understood, has been told, talked about as her lover. And, and from there indicating that Mathura was a woman of loose sexual morals. Yeah. And because she was a woman of loose sexual morals, therefore the court interpreted that she gave consent to the sexual act. Yeah. So that, that was a line of argument that was taken by, by actually the Supreme Court on the Mathura rape case. This was a judgment that came in 1979, of course, many, many years ago. And yet a big important turning point in feminist jurisprudence. Why? Because post Mathura, there was an open letter that was written by four professors, all of them law professors in India, to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India. And in this letter, there were two things. There were many things. I'll talk about just two things for you know want of time. There were two things that this letter said. One was that Mathura is this woman who is a who is a tribal woman who has gone to a police station a police station already symbolizes power and you have two policemen who are uh you know exploitative on mathura and then the judgment is saying that there aren't any marks of resistance to prove that mathura resisted to that act of sexual intercourse, yeah. So the open letter said that is the is are the honourable judges mistaking submission to be consent? So there is a very valuable conceptual question: when you submit to domination, do you necessarily consent to an act of sex? Yeah. And so the, so the argument that is being used here on, on, on the concept of consent is that can you say that if you're submitting to power, you are being so, you know, if I'm, if I'm not using the word consent, then I'll use the word obedient. Yeah. Does obedience necessarily mean that you are consenting to something? Yeah, because obedience stems from the fact that there is power and there is domination and there is authority. So the open letter is actually asking this very valuable question and making a distinction between submission and consent and saying that, you know, can you say that submission is consent? That's that's the question. That's one, you know, I would think a very important philosophical question that the open letter raised. A second question that the open letter raised was that can law be accessible to the most marginalized in this country? A country which has a constitution which talks about, you know, equality and justice for all. Can anybody, can any ordinary citizen in this country, can they walk to the courts of law and get justice? This open letter is actually suggesting that clearly the Mathura judgment says that there is no space for the ordinary people to get justice. Yeah, because if you go to the police station, then you can actually be raped. Yeah, that was Mathura's experience. So these two questions, both on consent and on power, was something that the open letter raised. It, it's an important turning point because 
rape law reforms happen post the Mathura rape case. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I was going through uh, some of the reading materials that you have gathered. Many of those readings around feminism and law in India actually revolve around the Mathura rape case. So, uh, you know, those, those are important texts to actually engage with to understand this question around consent and domination and power. It was only after the 2012 Delhi gang rape that for the first time within law, there was a definition of consent. Yeah, till before 2012, you did not have a definition of consent in law. And, you know, for, for uh, all of our convenience, I would like to read out what this definition of consent is in uh you know in the indian law post 2012 just give me one second consent is an unequivocal voluntary agreement when the woman by words gestures or any form of verbal or nonverbal communication communicates willingly to participate in a specific sexual act. Let me just type, uh, you know, uh, copy paste this on the chat box for everybody to know. Yeah. So this is the definition of consent. If you look at the chat box, it's it's the definition of consent, which comes as an explanation in Section 375 of the Indian Penal Code is this. That consent means an unequivocal voluntary agreement when the woman by words, gestures, or any form of verbal or nonverbal communication communicates willingness to participate in the specific sexual act. So you have to be very uh, vocal about the fact that you, you want that sexual act. Because if you don't, then, then that is rape. Yeah, then that sexual act is happening against your consent, right? Now, having got this definition in 2012, two recent judgments go, you know, kind of qualify this very interestingly. One is the Mahmoud Faruqi judgment, yeah, which brings about something called a feeble no, yeah. So you have to say no to the act of sex, but then you have to be very aggressively saying no, yeah. You can't, you know, it's it's literally like you can't just say no. Yeah. It's you 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 have to say no to the extent that the other person very clearly understands. And you know, even in that word unequivocal, uh, which is there in the law, that kind of uh, that kind of brings that out, you know. During a during an act of exploitation, during an act of you know, violence that is happening on you, your mind still has to work in such a way that you can unequivocally communicate something. Yeah, that's what, uh, you know, literally that's what the law wants us to do. And that is the reason why in the Mehmood Feru Faruqi judgment, it is being said that, yeah, the woman did say no, but you know, she did not really say it strongly and clearly enough. Yeah, it was mild, it was feeble, which, which, which has room for ambiguity. Yeah. And interestingly, you know, it is towards the side of the man that the room for ambiguity, uh, you know, the law law uh, went on the side of man. Something similar with respect to the Tarun Tejpal judgment that also happened recently. If you've been following the news, then you would know that even here, it was not actually about consent, etc. It was the past sexual history of the woman that kind of dominated the way in which the judgment eventually came, which acquitted Tejpal. Yeah. So it's it's this extremely muddy, messy terrain of consent and uh, you know non-consent, and how is it that you show your consent? Uh, uh, how boldly, how aggressively, how unambiguously, you have to remember that all of this is happening when an act of violence is happening. Yeah, uh, it is, it is, you know, it's not just about, you know, you're entering a room and somebody is saying that, you know, is it fine uh, uh, to, to, to switch on loud music? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not like that. Yeah, it's an act of violence. And at that time, you have 
your mind has to work in such a way that later on in the court of law you will be able to prove that you know there is resistance marks there are uh, you know unequivocal nose all of that yeah so that's that's the way in which <laughs> clearly laws work and there's there's been a lot of critique around um, in in feminist literature around both Mahmood Farooqi very recently around Tarun Tejpal lot has been written around Mathura again you know dollops of literature of course around the 2012 gang rape a second example of consent which we don't talk about so much that I want to uh, you know mention so we usually talk about consent with violence yeah and. Um, trying to actually think that there is in, in a very, very different sphere consent comes. And that is in the choice of partner, especially with respect to companionship and marriage. Yeah. Very recently, the Allahabad High Court has given a very interesting judgment. And in that judgment, the Allahabad High Court, which was, you know, sitting on a case of a, uh, of uh, a, a heterosexual couple who belongs to inter-community. So there's one Hindu person and another Muslim person. And uh, there was a complaint that was made against them that they have married and this marriage, and this marriage cannot be accepted because they are interfaith. The Allahabad High Court have actually said that if two adults consent to companionship and staying in a domestic sphere, then there is nobody who can stop them. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is that it's a very different way in which you are understanding consent. But something that is important for us to remember is that consent or an act of consent becomes very important when you when you choose, when you make a choice in this case, around your life partner. Yeah. And I'm sure again, many of you, you would be reading newspapers, you would be knowing about in the last few years, and more recently, there are so many incidents of abduction, kidnapping, murder, cup panchayats being in place, anti conversion laws now being in place, which says that two people of different faiths cannot marry each other. Now, the irony is that this clearly goes against the law of the land. We have something called a Special Marriages Act of 1954, which allows anybody to marry anybody. Yeah, irrespective of caste and religion. Yeah, so that's the law of the land. And still in 2021, we are actually dealing with you know, cases which says that you cannot marry. If you marry, you will be killed uh, or we will do a complaint or you go to court. And it is fortunate that we had the Allahabad High Court who upheld the principle of adults consenting to domestic companionship and said that if, if two adults want it, then families cannot resist. Yeah. So I think what I'm trying to say through uh, the, the principle, the concept of consent is that it is not only the state which or the police, which is, you know, which is taking away consent from us as adults thinking persons, but it is also family networks and community networks, which disallow us to exercise our own choice and consent. Which makes me come to my last, uh, you know, set of uh, thoughts, which is around care. And this is a more recent, uh, I think care jurisprudence is very, very recent in India and it is yet to, it is yet to actually take its, uh, you know, full course or take its full shape. But care jurisprudence is something that we have started seeing with respect to persons with disabilities. Again, a category or a set of people about whom we don't talk about at all. Yeah, usually, usually, yeah. 
So in 2016, the government of India passed what is called the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act. And it is in this legislation that for the first time, it right to care or right to receive care actually was something which was enshrined as a right through a law. Yeah, and I think what I'm trying to trying to communicate to you is that you know we we kind of take it for granted that members of the family will care for us, will love us, will protect us. Yeah, clearly that is always not the case. Yeah, and especially if there are children with disability in a family, they may not be cared for. They may also be hidden from public eye because of the shame that, you know, members of the family, let's say, might experience. I don't know how many of you have seen Burfi, but Burfi is a good example of what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So, but as individuals who, who are born in this world and, you know, everybody definitely, but also, of course, those of us who have parents and guardians and caregivers, there is a right to care. We all have a right to be loved. We all have a right to be cared and uh, supported. Yeah. However, while it is something that is assumed for persons with disability, especially for children with disability, it is not something that they can take for granted. And that is the reason why I feel that this language of care which is entering the legal framework through, you know, through a principle of, you know, it is, it is, it is just through a principle of justice that it is, it is just to care for everybody, people, children with disability, one of them is something that is, I, I, I personally feel that it is actually very important and it is, it is just opening up the canvas around care jurisprudence. We do not really have a care jurisprudence in this country. And what I would want us to remember is that although it is starting, let's say, with persons with disability, it has the potential philosophically, it has the potential to move beyond persons with disability. Why? You have to think about elderly care in a country like India, yeah, where there is no state support for you know people, those who, those who are senior citizens. I'm sure many of you may have noted that during the pandemic, the precarity of the elderly came out strongly, especially those who live by themselves. Maybe their children work somewhere else. Domestic workers were not being able to come to homes because of lockdown. What does the elderly do? Does the state have any mechanism of caring for the elderly? No, at this point in time, no. But what I'm trying to say is that given that we have the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act today, which is a 2016 legislation, which enshrines the principle of right to care, yeah, within its legislation, you can extend it from people with disability to elderly people as well, yeah, to maybe people who live by themselves, so single women, deserted women, yeah, those, those can be, uh, you know, categories, those can be spaces where, the, you know, where this concept and also the, the principle of care can actually extend, yeah, so this, this is new. It is not something which is there in India for a very long period of time. Uh, it is not there legally, yeah. But it it is assumed culturally that children will take care of parents. Parents will take care of children. It's something assumed culturally, and in in uh, you know in some kind of a community framework. But clearly, that is not the way in which it happens, and it excludes many people even when it is assumed right? Like the elderly, like the disabled, like the sick, because we think of all of these as burdens. Yeah, we don't. But why? Because they are non-productive people. Yeah. So, so in that context, the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act, I think, is an important example of care, feminist care jurisprudence in India. 
So I would stop by just, you know, summarizing in two or three sentences what I tried to do from the beginning. I went through four concepts, equality, difference, consent, and care. And literally, I tried to do a chronological mapping of feminist jurisprudence in India, which began with equality, where difference coexisted with equality, but then the principle of difference also evolved and transformed over a period of time. And that is the reason why, let's say, in 2005, we had the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act. It is a, it is a transformation of the principle of difference, pushing the boundaries of the principle of difference. But we take many steps back in the 2006 Kherlanji judgment, where the principle of difference could have been used, but it was not used. So it's, I would think that it is, it is a few steps back. So, so that's the second thing. The third thing is the principle and the, uh, you know, concept around consent, where also I think we've, we've actually moved forward and moved many steps back. Yeah, from Mathura to the uh, Delhi gang rape to the Tejpal judgment, I think we are constantly moving back and forth around consent and it's this messy terrain where consent and uh, where consent and violence is connected. But I want you to remember that consent and choice, self-choice is of, of our everyday lives is something that is equally important. And finally, we arrive at care, which is very recent, which is a space that feminist jurisprudence is just opening up and, and and through it you know i think there is a lot of potential to to get to questions of social justice and inclusion i think i'll stop if there are questions comments any discussion please feel free thank you so much ma'am it was like really insightful lecture and Seriously, thank you so much for bringing the whole major debates and discussion around these four major concepts. Like, as you mentioned, like, to why these four concepts? Like, I think at the end of this lecture, we are able to understand why these four concepts of equality, difference, consent, care, through the very different legal lens and the principle of difference. That is, I think, very not much discussed in general as the principle of equality is discussed further bringing this whole topic of formal substantive equality with the notion of the hierarchies that are coexisted in the Indian constitution and, uh, their, and the different roots of injustices and how the system has further evolved from different socio-economic and legal aspect. Like as ma'am mentioned that the legacy of judgment and atrocities committed on marginalized section I think it is very imperative to understand the whole caste-based violence in the society and different judgments basically from those angles because most of the judgments I think uh, misses, these ang misses these topics and discussions. So it is very important to have uh, uh, highlight all these points that ma'am mentioned. And uh, with that, like further ma'am put it for put put forward the idea and the definition of consent from different social legal dynamics and stating the different trajectories of rape and custodial rape from the viewpoint of a feminist jurisprudence i think it is extremely important to understand the whole spectrum of power hierarchy that is dominating the choices consent and decisions of women and keeping them in a whole cage like as uh, the whole the bird cage analogy i can mention it here like this can be seen in that this dynamics and like as ma'am mentioned the very concept of care jurisprudence that is recently that is like very paramount through ages but recently people started noticing it in the very light of covid 19 and i think it is very important as suggested by you to take some legal actions and establish a very formal institution for the care jurisprudence not from the basic lens of the community lens. So thank you, ma'am. Uh, now, uh, as Ritu ma'am is unable uh, for the concluding remarks, I think we can take up the questions. So. I'm going through the questions on the chat box. OK, ma'am. Uh, so do you want me to read the questions? Not at all. I, I, I can see it. So I'll, I'll, I'll just go one by one. Okay, ma'am. 
or is it is it a protocol for you to read it out then i don't have i no, don't no, know ma'am no, no it's, it's completely it's com I, i just thought that it's no it's, it's completely fine. Fine, fine, fine it's completely fine uh, i'll take up the questions from youtube once yes. the zoom questions are right like sure right. uh okay uh, so first of all thank you everyone for your extremely kind words uh, that that you are writing i'm uh, i am um, i'm delighted that if this uh, discussion um uh, furthers your interest on reading around feminist jurisprudence i think that's the that's the major idea that you know a discussion like this will 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 uh, uh will push you to read debates around feminist jurisprudence so thanks for all your very very kind words i'll start with and i think this is the first question if i'm not wrong yeah uh uh by amisha who says uh, uh maybe a very ideal chasing question that's the only thing we have amisha for so let's not be apologetic about it at all but still would like to ask what do you see making the most significant difference to jurisprudence for example do you think composition of judiciary has a lot to do with it so you know amisha yes the composition of the judiciary i think is a very very important aspect of the kind of judgments that we get and uh unfortunate or ironic as it is uh so there is there is uh, uh, uh there is actually a, a, a what should i say a jurisprudential field which is called legal realism which kind of believes in who are the people uh you know who 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 uh, who make laws so uh so one is the composition of the judiciary clearly just in terms of individuals but i think it is also important for us to probably remember that we cannot have all our hopes on the judiciary only because the law making process is a very lengthy process yeah it uh, there are parliamentarians who are involved in the law making process we have to remember that after all all laws are passed in the parliament or else they do not become a law yeah so there are parliamentarians involved and therefore the executive plays a very very important role in law making if you think about criminal law then the police has a very important role in it because any kind of criminal law can go to court only if the police takes it right uh, uh if if there has been a complaint which has been lodged in the police station and there are so many occasions in which the police actually just flat denies taking domestic violence cases ye to apne beech ka mamla hai nipat lo apne hi mein these are things you know very normally that we get to hear right so what i'm trying to say is that while i agree that it is the composition of the judiciary is important but i think we also will have to think about uh what is happening in the parliament who is there in the police station so therefore then to pin it down to individuals is something which would be difficult we have to think about it more structurally and more ideologically because i think what is happening in the law is ideology it definitely is about individuals i will not deny it uh uh you know if uh if in in many of the recent judgments if we didn't have justice chandrachur then we wouldn't have had certain dissenting opinions or we wouldn't have had certain kinds of judgments that's true but then it's it's not just about this one individual or this one person so it is more ideological and i'm trying to think that through our uh you know more detailed engagement how is it that we can make a uh make an impression around this ideology and i would think that collectives like you you need you could play a very important role by you know holding these discussions but also probably just writing about these yeah it's important for us to actually read laws read judgments comment on them we leave all of this all of it to law students to do it and we think that you know we who are social scientists we can't read the law i haven't studied law ever in my life yeah i am a sociology student and 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 i think that it's it's very important that as social scientists we engage with the law we write about it we talk about it we use different mediums through which we create a counter ideology uh so yeah so that's uh, 
uh, okay, so uh, Shonali Ahuja, she asks if I could talk a little about the Vishaka guidelines and the Posh Act. Uh, can be a subject matter of funful lecture, but what I would probably want to say is that even the Vishaka guidelines and the Posh Act is based on the principle of difference. Yeah, so on the principle of equality, there is, you know, women can go out to the workplace and work, but then as being women, they can face, in this case, it is sexual harassment. Right, uh, and that is that is the way in which the Vishaka guidelines and then the Posh Act came. There is a way in which sexual harassment is defined in both of these. The Vishaka guidelines came in 1996. The Posh Act comes in 2013. Uh, and there's you know there's a lot of water that travels uh, between 1996 and 2013. But what is I think what is important is that in Vishaka and Posh. There's this concept of hostile work environment, which I think conceptually it is important for us to remember that what the guideline as well as the act intends to do is that we shouldn't should not have a hostile work environment. Yeah. So how is it? But then what is very interesting is that who will ensure that you do not have a hostile work environment? Very interestingly, it is said that it is the responsibility of the employer to ensure there is a non-hostile work environment. So then the employer has to be made accountable. That is very important, yeah. But again, like the Maternity Benefits Act, the Posh Act is also applicable for women in the formal sector only, except for in the Posh Act, domestic workers come under the Posh Act, yeah. That's a very interesting, uh, a category who have been brought in under the Posh Act. So if domestic workers come under the Posh Act, then what is the, what is the site of the workplace? The site of the workplace is actually the domestic space, which is the home. Yeah. So that's, that's a very interesting, tricky, messy, uh, and, and you can understand the power hierarchies that will be working within the home, right? Between an upper, upper middle class woman who is, let's say, the employer and the working class woman who has come to that household to work. There, there is a power equation there as well, right? So it's a messy terrain, but it is a very, very important addition, I think, in the Posh Act, bringing in domestic workers but not many other non-informal workers, right? So the trouble with the, these two maternity benefits and uh, anti-sexual harassment acts are labor laws, yeah? But these labor laws are, are applicable only in the formal sector. So that's, that's the problem. Please read up how the sexual harassment is defined in these, it's available online, so I don't want to get into it. Uh, Madhurima, you say by saying that maternity benefit is a right while paternity leave is not, aren't we biologizing this right? This excludes mothers, non-heterosexual couples who choose surrogacy and adoption. How can we envision maternity rights in this context? I did not intend to, uh, I did not intend to get there. The only reason why I said that maternity benefits is a right is because it is something which has come through years of feminist movement and demands and a campaign. And also the International Labour Organization responding to it and the Indian government responding to it in 1961. So I'm kind of trying to say that it has a history of campaign and movement. We can understand no law without histories of movements and campaigns. That's the reason why I said maternity benefit is a right. To that extent, paternity benefit is not a right because nobody asked for it. Yeah, you don't have men's groups asking for we want paternity rights. Neither do we have women's groups asking for, you know, men should play an equal role in, uh, uh, you know, in raising up children. I wish all of these groups did that and made paternity leave a right. I really wish to advocate it that paternity leave should also be a right. But in order for it to become a right, there has to be a uh, you know, collective movement and a campaign through which we can talk about it. At the moment, the central government gives 15 days of paid leave for men for paternity. Yeah. Now, uh, it's very interesting when the 2017 amendment to the Maternity Benefits Act happened, there were some journalists who had asked the Women and Child Development Minister at that point of time that 
Why is it that you're not increasing paternity leave? The response was shocking. Uh, the minister said that men, if they take this leave, they will only take it as a leave and they will not do any work. And that is the reason why I am not extending paternity leave. Yeah, you can understand how shocking it was. You can also understand how she biologized immediately that the act of care is only that of the mother. Yeah, so I'm definitely not promoting that, but I'm trying to suggest that we start talking about equal uh, equal wor shared workload in the household. And especially in the pandemic where work from home has become a new norm, it is important to talk about shared, you know, domestic responsibilities within which caring for the child is also there. So that's, that's one response. And another response is you're very right that, uh, you know, Maternity Benefits Act actually excludes non-heterosexual couples and also excludes uh, and also excludes the uh, the surrogate mother it doesn't exclude the mother who adopts so that's that's something that you uh, uh, you know uh, uh, that's that's incorrect what you've written which is that within the maternity benefits act if i am adopting uh, if i'm a uh, you know paid worker in a government uh, department and if i am adopting a baby then i can make, get maternity benefit yeah however what is interesting is that the, that the age of the baby has to be less than 1 year yeah, then I can claim a maternity benefit. Yeah, if the baby that I adopt is, let's say, two years, then I cannot claim a maternity benefit. So there lies the trouble. But adop adoption is part of maternity benefit. Within surrogacy, the commissioning mother. So if I want a surrogate baby and I am the commissioning mother who is asking somebody to become the surrogate mother, I will get maternity benefit as a commissioning mother, but the surrogate mother who actually bears the child, she will not get a maternity benefit. You can understand how clearly power hierarchy is playing here, right? Because I am this person who can actually employ, let's say, a surrogate mother. I get the benefit, but she doesn't. Yeah. So that's uh, uh, those are the kinds of and, uh, you know, gay couples, lesbian couples, they uh, 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 they, they still cannot claim maternity benefits. That's actually uh, one of the demands that are being raised. If you read, if you read writings coming out from the um, coming out from a feminist organization called Sama S A M A, they do a lot of work around motherhood and these complex questions in um, in terms of maternity. Okay, Vaishali, you say, what do you think about consent in sexual harassment of children? Uh, the, the, there's, there's some law which is called the POXO protection of sexual offenses against the child. Uh, it, it does, um, you know, it does talk about the complex question of consent um, within uh, of sexual harassment of children. And I think if I if I got you right, then uh, then maybe you're 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 probably trying to ask that. Do children, can children consent to sex, if I if I understood you correctly? As for the eyes of the law, actually, no. Anybody who is less than 18 cannot consent to sex. And, and again, that's, that's a change in the law that happened in 2012. Till before 2012, uh, it, this, this age of consent was 16. Yeah, so it was two notches, two years below. But in post 2012, it has been raised to 18. So today we have both the age of marriage and age of consent as the same age. Yeah. And that creates a lot of trouble, primarily because we all know about young adults uh, wanting to probably explore sexual relationships. And all of it actually can come under not, not sexual harassment, Vaishali, it can actually come under rape. Yeah, it is not sexual harassment, it will come under rape. Uh, Sana, you are asking, can I elaborate on relation of choice and equality? So if I have understood the question correctly, uh, then do all of us have equal choices to make? No. So I think choice is intrinsically dependent on social location. Yeah. And that is the reason why the principle of difference becomes very important for us to engage with the question of choice as well as consent. 
Yeah. Uh, primarily because, and I'm kind of trying to think about this through, you know, the example of marriage that I gave. And, you know, so those of you who watched this movie, Serat, which is a Marathi movie uh, around intercaste, uh, love and marriage, then you know, uh, and the Hindi version of it is Dharak, if that is more familiar. But if you haven't watched it, watch watch the Marathi version. Uh, so it, then you know that what is what is being discussed there is intercaste, a choice to be in love with a person who doesn't belong to my caste, right? But if you realize that choice is something that you can exercise only when you come away from the village to the city. Yeah. So being in the village, you cannot marry someone who is of a different caste. Yeah. You come to the city, you set up a household, you marry everything. But your choice eventually is still not respected. Yeah. So the film actually ends by violence. Yeah. The two, two people who exercise their choice, they are killed. Yeah. So I think what I'm trying to say is that, you know, you can never, you can never talk about choice in a vacuum. Yeah. You always have to talk about choice in connection to social location, caste, religion, region, you know, which part of the world are you? Yeah. At this juncture with the pandemic, who can travel where is something which is dependent upon whether I am in India or whether I am in Canada. Yeah. And you know, the Australian government will not allow, th things like border closures have happened, right? Where is the choice to travel in a free world? It doesn't exist. The pandemic has actually shown us that big time. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's what I uh, meant. So, uh, Shonali, you are saying, is the reason for such less feminist jurisprudence in India, the lack of women at an important position? We've never had a woman CJI. I would, uh, you know, beg to disagree a little with you, Shonali. I don't think that we don't have feminist jurisprudence in India. I actually think we have a really rich feminist jurisprudence in India. What we definitely do not have, as you're saying, is we do not have adequate representation of women in judiciary. Yeah. Having said that, it is also important for us to always question. So, you know, this is a two way thing, right? We want more women in positions of authority, but then we also want them to use principles of feminism. Yeah. Having women in positions of judiciary necessarily will not give us feminist jurisprudence. Yeah. So representation is important, but primarily because representation will bring visibility. Representation will bring, you know, multiple and plural voices. But representation necessarily doesn't ensure equality. Yeah. Or necessarily in this case doesn't ensure that because you are a woman in the judiciary, you will be able to exercise feminist principles. Yeah. Because you're actually operating within a structure which is clearly not feminist. Rishav, okay, there are many questions, I suppose. Um, Rishav, how do you approach rights discourse while implementing equality non-discrimination, especially with respect to special rights discourse? How does a nation's socioeconomic condition affect which discourse is undertaken? Uh, I don't know whether I'm actually understanding this, this question correctly. Uh, So, Hello. Yeah, Dr. Rukmani, yeah. I would like to interrupt here since there are too many questions and uh, some of them are from YouTube. So I guess you can uh, limit yourself to two more questions from the chat box and then two more questions from YouTube, if that is fine. Yeah, it's... it's okay, it's, yeah, Nana, please take care of this. Sure. Yeah. Okay, it's fine. Uh, so, Rishav, I think if I've understood you correctly, you're kind of trying to say that, you know, with respect to the special rights discourse, so with this, so something like a special treatment. Uh, I, I, I think I made it clear in the lecture also that there isn't any contradiction between special rights and equality. In fact, they complement each other and they do not contradict each other. And I do not think that the nation's socioeconomic condition is in any way uh, 
negatively affected because of a special rights discourse. Uh, okay, so since I will have to take only two more questions from the chat box, I'll probably take this question on care that Sana is asking. Is the debate around care about personal care from social systems like families and parents, or is it the involvement of a government? Very good question. What if a social group, for example, a child or parent refuses to consent to caring for an individual? Uh, at this moment, Sana, I don't think that we have a caring principle of care with respect to the state. Yeah. Uh, so although we say that it is a welfare state, yet, uh, you know, if you look at things like elderly care, disability care, single women care, care for children in orphanages, we really do not have a robust system which ensures it. So, so to think, and also to say that social security measures are low to minimum. Yeah, minimum to not existing actually in this country. So yeah, I think what I'm trying to definitely suggest is that we need a principle of care and a care jurisprudence at a more structural level. Yeah, you need to talk about government policies which ensures care for various kinds of people. And again, healthcare is something which is so important. You, we, we realized it right all through the pandemic. But at the same point of time, I'm also saying that together with the need for a structural understanding of care, we also need to create a discourse of right to care within the family. Yeah. And by which I'm not necessarily trying to say that if somebody says that I don't want to take care of my parents, that person needs to be jailed. I'm not suggesting that. But I'm definitely suggesting that, you know, in, in countries like India and other countries in South Asia, we kind of just tend to assume that children will take care of the parents and parents will take care of the children, you know, primarily through the principle of love or whatever. Yeah. And, I'm, I, and, I'm, and I think that what I'm suggesting is that with families disintegrating in a big way, we need to talk about other kinds of care networks. Yeah, not just through families, friendship care networks, collective care networks, neighborhood care networks, right? Not only through kinship. I think that is what I'm suggesting, which is important as a principle in a more informal way, together with the state talking about care. So that's, that's the, um, sense that I had, but thank you very much for that question. Um, okay, so there are two questions around what does substantive equality means. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll just address that. So, you know, what by substantive equality, what I mean is that there is something which is written in the text of law. Yeah, so law in book, law in paper. Yeah, but is there law in action? Yeah, that's that's the first response to what is substantive equality. When you think about substantive equality, you have to remember whether that law which is in the text, whether you see that in action, whether that is implementable, that's one. But the second thing is that when you think about substantive equality, you also have to remember that so the law may say that everybody is equal in the eyes of law, but we live in social hierarchy. Yeah. So how is it that as a society, as, as a move, as you know, collective mobilization and movement, how is it that we are changing that social hierarchy? Law always will not be able to do it. People have to do it. Yeah. So that is the importance of people's movement, which has to constantly, you know, make the law or the legal system accountable constantly. Yeah. So when you when you talk about substantive equality, you have to remember that there can be legal equality, which is which is operating in a social hierarchy. So how do you ensure that that social hierarchy is reduced, is abolished? An example. Dr. Ambedkar talked about the annihilation of caste. Yeah. So unless there is annihilation of caste, caste-based hierarchy doesn't go away. Yeah. That's your, you know, that's the need for substantive equality. I'll stop and uh, Nana, if you would give me two questions from uh, YouTube. Yes, ma'am. Sure. So uh, the first question is uh, from Sri Toma Ghosh. 
so she thank you for the amazing lecture uh, and the question is uh, can you shed some light on the, the progress in at least the philosophical aspect if not judicial for consent in context of marital rape uh, there actually hasn't been much progress uh, 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 primarily because you know the way in which the law understands this uh, the law actually don't doesn't think that marital rape exists yeah that's my first uh, you know crass answer because that's what it is uh, if you read section 375 which is the rape law there is an exception clause and the exception clause is that you will not talk about rape within marriage yeah it's it's not said like this but you know if you uh if you make it accessible then this is what it is yeah that rape doesn't happen within marriage so that's that's the first response that you know in all of these years we still remain with the colonial legacy of uh, the indian penal code and rape where marriage uh, where rape doesn't happen within marriage that's one thing but the second thing that i would i however want to say is that if you are interested then you may want to look at uh, the justice varma committee report which came after uh, the delhi gang rape there's actually a section around marital rape and the justice varma committee report had talked about of doing away with that exception clause and bringing in rape within marriage as an accepted you know a legal uh, uh, a legal presence but eventually we did not get it the parliament did not pass uh, pass it it was only a recommendation but you might get some clues in the justice varma committee report about the way they were making the argument as to why it should you know it should come as of now there is there is literally no movement in terms of the law because it remains the same as it was when the indian penal code um, you know came into being also this re uh, this report is available in the reading list also uh, so, so the second question is uh, former cji ranjan gogai presiding over the sexual harassment trial against him and clearing himself of the charges and accepting a promotion to the upper house within 3 months of retirement he went on to say that uh, she has made an attempt to attack the independence of justice what is uh, you what is your take on that ma'am uh, how can uh, this misuse of power be eliminated this is the last question <laughs> uh, you 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 have it you you answered it yourself actually uh, which is that it is a misuse of power so there isn't any um, um there isn't any there's no point discussing that how can any form of misuse of power be eliminated i think that is a broader question and you see that in the context in in various contexts right uh in this case it was the context of the judiciary but you see it in various contexts so uh the only way in which you can uh think about um eradicating power is by raising voice against it now when i say that i know that it is not something that is that can easily be done yeah uh sometimes we are in a position to raise voice collectively yeah years of women's movement anti caste movement indigenous peoples movement in india have shown us the importance of you know raising voices collective voices to counter power and authority but sometimes but together with collective voices there are also you know individual modes and mechanisms through which we meander through processes of power yeah uh so what i'm trying to say is that there is not a there is there is no one answer to how is it that you can eliminate misuse of power yeah but there are multiple techniques strategies creative measures subversive techniques that we need to use in order to raise in order to uh you know a, a phrase that is used a lot with in in journalistic circles that you speak truth to power yeah this this 
speaking truth to power is 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 something that is that is used a lot and i i i would definitely want to believe and want to think that that's one way of questioning and countering power yeah it's not easy it is uphill uh and yet people continue to do it i'll stop thank you ma'am for answering all the questions like uh, most of the people who are having certain doubts like i think from all these question answer round all these doubts are also clear uh, also uh, i think neetu ma'am is like uh, here so neetu ma'am uh, would you like to take yes yes thank you nana and thank you so much uh, ma'am for uh, uh, such a nice lecture as you could have already seen the way all the audiences have responded already and everybody is so happy that they could know lots of new aspects of how this uh, notion of equality and difference and consent and care could uh, be manifested in our daily lives without us noticing it and uh, uh, i have read the cases of mathura and then this whole vishakha rules and everything the way you have tried to uh, throw lights on these cases that has give, given me a completely new insight to that and uh, uh, in, for us even though we belong to philosophy discipline uh, to look into these cases and all these uh, different aspects of jurisprudence is i guess not only important but very uh, I, i must say mandatory so thank you so much thank you so much for uh giving such a nice lecture which everybody here has enjoyed and i guess uh, um, you know everybody who is here will second me on this so thank you so much and thank you nana for taking care of the session so wonderfully thank you thank you so much thank you ma'am for this like really imperative lecture and i think it is very important to take this discussion further and we would really happy to host you For, uh, in future to keep this discussion and uh, ideas on so that we can keep on engaging like as you suggested to keep this community engagements alive and also will surely incorporate the suggestion by you to take these things in writing and putting uh, on these things on our blog so that people can read it vastly too uh, also uh, i would like to thank ritu ma'am for her unconditional support through for this whole series and along with that i would like to thank whole organizing team and uh, audience for attending this session and for putting this really great questions and uh, also the reading list is updated on the website for that uh, also i again thank ma'am for suggesting readings and cha like changes and everything so the final reading list is updated on our website and the quiz will be available for the session on 26 july 2021 thank you thank you very much uh, nena thank you very much dr jaiswal and and also all the participants for uh, you know for being here for listening so intently and for all these amazing questions that you had thank you for being such an engaged audience uh, it's it's always a pleasure uh, to talk to uh, it's always a challenge as well as a pleasure to talk to you know Uh, a, a, a set of people who belong to very different disciplines, uh, uh, and yet being able to get these amazing questions that you had. I'm sorry, I think I couldn't answer two or three questions. If you want, just write to me on my email ID. Nana knows it, uh, so you can get it from her. Um, and I hope that you continue to do this really amazing work through the philosophy project that you are doing. Thank you, ma'am. Bye. Thank you. Bye, ma'am. Bye.